Thank you very much uh, for giving me the time. But uh, Dr. Shiba is sitting there, and I will not dare to say that uh, CABG is better than PCI. <laughs> uh, see, for a physician, they, they can they go on for debates that uh, this is better, DAPA is better, spinal lectern is better. Uh, as a cardiac surgeon or as a surgeon, we know very little, but we do much. And uh, uh, fortunately, it is a good thing that cardiologists, they are in, uh, in competition. They are tackling the complex lesions of the coronary arteries. So, uh, first thing, this debate about uh, uh, this debate about PCI versus CABG, I don't agree there should be a debate. It should be a teamwork. And whatever experience I have uh, in my career, and whatever we are doing at AIMS since we started, uh, I am going to share uh, you about that experience. And that, that few slides will uh, give you the answer uh, what needs to be done, where uh, PCI is better, or where uh, CABG is better. So it's, it's not, I'm not going into verses, there are a uh, lot of uh, studies, uh, meta-analysis being done. But yes, uh, definitely CABG uh, has advantage uh, in many situations. But yes, PCI, when you offer an acute situation, it definitely helps. It definitely uh, take out the patient uh, from very, uh, very, very bad situations. So, so let me share uh, our experience at AIMS Bathinda. I'm not talking about what I've done uh, previously for the last 18, 20 years in Ludhiana at uh, Dhyanan Medical College or at Christian Medical College. It's a very, very uh, short experience where we have done uh, 60 cases and any, any unit, uh, whatever worth is, that 60% of the practices today are in dealing with coronary artery diseases. So 45 uh, 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 coronary artery surgeries we have done, all on beating heart and rest 15 were congenital. We are still in inception stage, so this data is very limited. And uh, if you, we go by demographics, uh, since April we started, and in September, you, if you will see that mean age is between 50 to 70 years, maximum patients fall in this group. And Type of vessels like majority were triple vessel disease and few patients have a left main uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, mainly patients get two grafts or wherever it is required we put three grafts. So if you see the average ejection fraction, majority of uh, patients were less than 50% but there is a sub uh, good chunk where ejection fraction is close to 30 to 40%. So, first, this is first slide. This 47 years old patient uh, presented to uh, me uh, with diabetes and unstable angina. If you see at the picture, unfortunately, I could not convert into a format where video format is there. But if you see, there is a very diffuse disease in the LAD in the very proximal part. Before the first septal, it is almost cut off, 90% disease. And if you see the mid part of the LAD in the first slide, uh, uh, there is again uh, uh, diffusely diseased vessel and if you see the third slide uh, down there, RCA is totally cut off. So what we did was, uh, we, we, I put left internal memory artery and left radial artery on the left side because right side there was nothing, as his ejection friction was close to 35%. So I, I used two grafts. Now in the second uh, example which I am giving is the 67 years old male again uh, presented with the osteo left main disease which is close to 70 percent and right coronary artery completely cut off and again if you see the circumflex area in the second slide a first slide itself again a very diffuse disease vessel he's again a diabetic he has a diabetic and hypertensive and as we know majority of patients which we they are presenting they are diabetic so we use lima and uh, right uh, saphenous vein graft and Right septum's vein graft, I have to do endotectomy. I have to remove that plaque because there was no lumen on the right side. So PDA, I opened the PDA, there was no lumen. I have to take out the uh, 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 plaque there and so, so I, I was able to graft. 
Now again, third example, he's again a 62 years old, hypertensive, diabetic, diffuse coronary artery disease. On the left side only, uh, and very, 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 very tight lesions. And LAD, if, if you can appreciate, we are not able to see the LAD very clearly, but there are collaterals. I, I, I was lucky to get a, a lima over the LAD graft and patient went fine. Now, we have used all the varieties of graft. We have used left internal memory artery, right internal memory artery, uh, uh, re reverse uh, septal vein graft and the radial artery. We have, we have used all the promote, permutation and combinations which you might uh, get from the patient follow-up. We used all type of graphs. So what we do, uh, this is we, we measure the flow also uh, during uh, surgery. This is a Doppler flow measurement. This was one of the very first patients. Uh, if you see, a, in the first uh, slide, there is a 32 ml of flow and with pulsatility index of 1.2. So what, what does it show? Pulsatility index is if it's more than 2.5, like we are getting very diffusely diseased vessel. If pulsatility index is more than 2.5, it means either your vessel is very diff uh, diseased or your anastomosis is wrong. So you, you either you put another graft, okay, if you don't put another graft, you will have uh, uh, multiple problems in the uh, during uh, post-op period. So I, I take, uh, Pulsatility index of 2.5. Some studies say that you can go up to 4.5 in diffusely diseased vessel. I don't agree with it because you have to have a runoff. You have to have a smooth vessel so that your graft should work. Similarly, uh, down slide there is a radial artery. Again, pulsatility index of 1.1. And when you see such a diffusely diseased vessels, so this uh, machine is very, Doppler is very helpful during surgery whether your outcome will be good or, or your prolonged results will be good. So that's what a few examples I have given you of where we have done surgery. Now, since uh, for the last one month in cath lab, when it started, we have done 150 interventional procedures and 50 of them were PTCS and couple of them were acute uh, uh, in the acute settings patient presented and then they did the PTCA. Now I must tell you first PTCA in acute uh, setting when the patient came they took 45 minutes from emergency to the cath lab. But when they did the next case they just took 25 minutes. And, I, and Shiva will agree with me that it's very important that your time period for revascularization should be as minimum. It should be less, standard is it should be from door to delivery, it should be less than 60 minutes. But here we are able to uh, decrease our time from door to stenting in less than half an hour. And, it, and it's a great achievement by uh, my colleagues and I'm very happy to share it. Now, Again, they have done something very wonderful in a very short span of time and I am very happy about that. Usually there is a tussle between the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. Cardiac surgeon always feels that uh, cardiologist being a gatekeeper, yes Shiva was my gatekeeper but I will tell you another story why I don't go for PCI versus CABG debate. So here a patient, uh, uh, a previous patient. They did a very uh, difficult pr procedure in the left circumflex artery. They, they used rota ablation as a it, It's very complex maneuver. And I was sitting in the cath hall for two hours and they were operating and I was very happy the way they were uh, moving their hands and moving using IVS to see the flow. And they felt that uh, after, if you see the last picture, uh, they felt that there was a distal dissection and they used the IVS and it was not. So results was very good because it was a very complex lesion. If you see the first slide, it was a very complex calcified lesion which they crossed. Now here in the another patient, good male Singh, very young patient, uh, close to 50s and uh, two uh, lesions, LAD is blocked. If you, if you see L after the bifurcation, the LAD is uh, having lesion at two places and circumflex at the origin. So they use two stents. You see the second picture, they are using one guide uh, in the LAD and they stented the uh, left circumflex artery. 
Similarly, they, and see the how the beautiful uh, circumflex artery is. So, so they use two stents. In the third stent, this patient again presented, uh, which uh, they stented the right coronary artery because symptoms were from right coronary artery. There's complete cutoff. They were able to make beautiful uh, right coronary artery after stenting. And if you see the fourth picture, she might need a hybrid procedure because at that time they were not able to uh, calculate the flows. They, they were suspecting that left main artery disease is there, but whether uh, we need to do FFR, but uh, that machine was not available, uh, soon it will be available with us. So, so it, she might need at later stage a hybrid procedure if left main disease is significant, she might, need, uh, she might go for CABG. That's how teamwork works. So this is one of the few examples that the type of disease, the type of uh, vessels which we are getting and where we need to stent them and where we need to uh, put in grafts. So again coming back to PCI versus CABG, as I said this is not about surgery, it is not about PCI, it is not about medical therapy, it is about making sure that patient gets the right treatment so they can have the best long term outcomes. So a team effort, a team approach, facilitating each other's concern, facilitating more so of a patient concern is the word, is the thing which we need to do. So we need to work at local level with the cardiology, with the heart team in order to make the right decision for the patient. That is the bottom line and that should be followed at every place. Now, Again, coming, now coming to the distinct shared decisions making and informed consent. Now, what we inform to the patients? Patient to aata hai, wo dara aata hai. Usko heart attack hai, uski family ko heart attack saath mein hota hai. So, whatever you sell at that time, we know, or whatever you say, aap bolo ke usko surgery versus PCI. If you give the option, I'll also follow ke PCI ka to. So th that's very important, what you tell them, what you feed them, because their mind are stuck, they are dumb. Most of them say, doctor, do what you want to do. So here, here informed consent is very important. You have to elaborate them. What are the benefit of PCI, what are the benefit of CAPG? Now, it should not be uh, like in a, in a good unit, I said 60% of the practice is uh, PCI or CAPG. It should not be, it should be a patient-centered care. What is beneficial for us, we should offer him. And it should be a shared decision making. And this happens very less. Either cardiologist will tell you, okay, do, go and uh, operate, or patient will come directly to us, okay, we need surgery. So, so where, that's why the importance of teamwork, that's why you have to gel with each other. Now, what are the factors uh, which should be considered whether we have to offer uh, surgery or PSPCI? Like coronary anatomy, left main disease, definitely advantages with CABG. Multivessel disease, if it's a diffusory disease, uh, patients, if ejection fractions are low, if you think uh, the, the, the risk factors for surgery are high, then offer them uh, PCI to an important vessel or open the LED. And, and go for uh, and or high anatomic complexity. Now cardiologists are doing bifurcation stenting. They are they, they are op operating uh, complex uh, procedures as I showed you in the our, our experience at AIMS. Then it, it should be a shared decision. Now we are uh, comorbidities. We have to take care of diabetes. We are the uh, capital of uh, diabetes, and most of our 80 percent of patients which I have operated, uh, they are diabetic. And especially in this region, I was talking to sir that, uh, that I don't know, there is some, uh, Dr. Noria can uh, tell me, there is something very different. They are very dehydrated, metabolically derangements are there, diabetes is worse than either they are uncontrolled diabetes or, or I don't know, diabetes is worse. Even after giving liters of fluid post-op, Urine out output on the very first two days, they, they don't uh, improve the urine output. But yes, once they are, uh, hydration is complete, 
they pour urine like that. They don't need even uh, lasix. Even 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 with the bad ventricles, they don't even uh, do. They they are in sort of a diuretic phase. That is that is how that in Ludhiana I have not seen such a phase. But here I am seeing they are very much dehydrated. Metabolically, there is some syndrome which needs to be uh, studied. So similarly, if there is a systolic dysfunction, uh, yes, uh, I said that if if ejection fractions are low, then you open one vessel, important vessel, and you come out. Or if ejection fraction is less than 30 percent, then mortality definitely agrees. It, it's not that 45 coronaries are done and they have gone home. There are a couple of uh, uh, problems were there. Initially, when you start a unit, there are bumpy rides, there are obstacles. I faced into problems in two, three cases uh, where because uh, their ejection fractions were low, close to 25 percent. In two uh, patients where I faced problem, their ejections were very ejection fractions were very low. But anything above 35 percent, we were very comfortably we were able to handle it. And I am sure uh, with the passage of time. Uh, with experience, we will be able to handle this. And again, calcified aorta, from surgical point of view, calcified aorta, aortic aneurysms, we need to take care of. Then there are procedural factors like uh, assess site for uh, PCI, sometimes your femoral arteries are calcified, then you can use a radial artery. What then, before deciding about surgery, whether it's what are the surgical risk or PCI risk, we need to uh, consider that before offering revascularization. Now, if a patient is unstable and he is presenting with unstable hemodynamics, you put balloon pump, I think that time you go for a culprit vessel and come out safely. And you have to go for patient preferences. If you say that you need multiple stents versus CABG, the patient will go for Google and he will see the Google guru and he might say that he will go for CABG if he's, he say, okay, PCI is safe. So his preference is must. Or if his un un inability or unwillingness to appear to uh, adhere to the uh, tubal antiplatelets mode, you have to see because if there are any risk factor, then you have to tailor your strategy according to their uh, risk factor. Some some religious beliefs uh, might not get operated. Patient education is must. Knowledge to the family is must. So. Uh, Surgically, if we, uh, the patients who are undergoing CABG, what we are worried about? We, we as a surgeon, uh, I, I will give him the maximum arterial grafts so that they should not have re-operations. We should, in COPD patients, we should go for early end extubation because prolonged uh, ventilation has its own problems. In, in kidney diseases, we should be worried about renal failure, death, yes. And in, in, in post surgery, yes, that, that's a devastating effect for the surgeon. Or incidence of stroke during surgery, deep external wound infections. Now, nowadays, we are using more and more of arterial grafts. You have to control the diabetic status of these patients very carefully in the post operative period. Because otherwise, you are taking out left internal memory artery or right internal memory artery. You are uh, devascularizing in the sternum, so that, that can create many problems. Or prolonged length of stay, you have to worry about those. Now, how you uh, define the lesion severity? Uh, see, if well, see, simple rule, thumb rule is, if any lesion which is more than 70% uh, tight, you revascularize it, because then there will not be any competitive flow. Or, or you do a PCI. Where there is an intermediate lesion, like 60 to 70 percent lesion, you are patient is diabetic, it's a calcified lesion, you are in doubt, then IVAS is there, FFR is there. Those are the armamentarium which helps you whether the patient needs uh, surgery or PCI. So the, the revascularization can be elective, urgent, emergency, depending upon the hemodynamics of the patients. Whether they are unstable, you have to stabilize them with IAPP or now even ECMO can be used to stabilize them and that, that's how you can uh, proceed. Now, uh, again PCI versus CABG in patients with complex disease. I will say if complex disease is there, complex coronary artery disease is there, so CABG is the first choice. 
but if uh, diffuse disease vessels are there, again I will go for, uh, I will open the main vessel through PCI and I will, if ejection fraction is low, I will recommend that uh, percutaneous interventions are better in those cases. So in diabetes with multivessel disease, yes, Lima 2 LD, LAD is the best choice because 20 years, more than 99% of the limas are open. If you have put a good graft, they have a good uh, long life rather than PCR. So if patient have no previous CABG, if, if again you have a symptoms, either you have not, uh, you have undergrafted them or, or complete vascularization or new lesion has developed. If a single vessel is there, you can, if you can open that vessel, you can go for PCI. If they are still the, on medical uh, treatment, if uh, still uh, uh, there is a disease, you can go for uh, multivessel diseases there, you can go for reoperations. Or if there is a complex CA, CAD, you, you think that that particular lesion is amenable to PCI, go for PCI. Similarly, in pregnant patients, I, I'll, I'll say that go for, if, if it's a single vessel disease, go for PCI. If uh, CABG should be the uh, very late choice. And in special uh, uh, situations where the kidney, there are acute kidney injury is there, uh, there are various dyes or special dyes are available. You use that during angiography. You hydrate them fully, even before taking surgery, you, you make them hemodynamically stable so that pressures are good. Yes, we, uh, that uh, uh, during heart for, uh, failure treatment, they were saying that uh, for cardiologists, uh, 90 pressure is good. I'm very happy uh, to listen that uh, physicians are saying that 90 pressure is good. Uh, 90 pressure, pressure is good for perfusion. If your mean pressure is close to uh, above 50, it will definitely be uh, good for the kidney. If mean pressure is below 50, it's not good for the kidney. So, so you have to stabilize the patient before uh, moving ahead. Uh, but post CABG, in uh, wherever there is acute kidney injury, that is one of the uh, risk factors uh, for, uh, for, 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 for uh, death, even mortality, morbidity increases with CABG. Now, there were various trials, need for intervention in stable angina. There was courage trial. Initially, they said, uh, you go for optimized uh, medical treatment. With optimization of medical treatment, still there are symptoms. They have to convert 36% of the patients uh, to PCI. Uh, you can interpret that. What I will say is that if patient, if lesion is amenable for PCI or revascularization, Rather than optimal uh, medical therapy, go for revascularization in stable angina. Similarly, uh, what what courage trial or freedom trial tell us? Early relief from angina uh, angina with PCI should be added to the optimization of the medical treatment. And if we go for a freedom trial, initially first six to twelve months, CABG definitely uh, a score over PCI, but after one, one year, the, uh, the, the, the progress is almost same. So, what are the barriers to complete revascularization? There can be clinical barriers like advanced age, cardiac comorbidities and non-cardiac uh, comorbidities. Uh, there can be anatomical barriers, which definitely our cardiology friends are breaking those barriers where the vessels are completely cut off. Uh, either they are using rota ablation or, uh, or, 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 or stents. Then, paucity, uh, because another problem is, like CABG 20 years data is available. Uh, but in PCI, not more than 4 years data is available in any type of stent. Because initially there was balloon angioplasty, then came the stent, then came the drug eluting stent, or now there are different kind of absorbable stents are there. So every uh, three to four years there is a change in the strategy. So what is good, it's still time, time is the uh, biggest uh, uh, healer and they will, uh, after say 10, 20 years, we can say that PCI is, and by the time pharmacogenetics is coming up, we might not need any revascularization procedures, that, that, that is the thing. Uh, 
then process barrier like setting up a new unit you you go for like uh, that my colleagues they have gone for atherectomy one of the uh, difficult procedures so so we are nursing, you have to train the nursing staff you have to train everybody so those are the uh, barriers which you have to cross before giving good results so even in the this slide uh, where they have used drug eluting stent era because now is the era of uh, drug eluting stent where the multi vessel coronary artery disease if you do the message simple is if you do incomplete revascularization uh, cardiac death and mi is more in, uh, in 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 patients where you you go for incomplete revascularization so is functional revascularization the answer see if lesions are insignificant whether there will be a competitive flow you go don't go for any revascularization if you, you if lesions are more than 70% or 80% if diffuse disease vessel then yes my answer is yes you must revascularize that so i was reading about coronary uh, chronic coronary disease i think team based approach is must non pharmacological therapies you should add dietary habits and uh, to improve and and pharmacological uh, uh, this thing to increase uh, to decrease the mortality cardiac rehabilitation programs many units they don't have that is a must like we were talking about uh, use of uh, sglt2 uh, inhibitors in uh, without diabetes mellitus yes role has again come up uh in the absence of mi long term uh, beta blocker is not recommended calcium calcium channel blocker is the first line of anti angiogenic therapy shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is safe and effective to prevent the risk of bleeding statins are the first line therapy uh, is must uh, lack of benefit for dietary supplements A lot of uh, things have come up like you use this supplement you use this supplement they have no beneficial effects uh routine periodic anatomic or ischemic testing only if if you have a significant clinical or functional problems then go for uh, ngo repeatedly or any ct ngo repeat, repeatedly then last message is for the youngster e cigarettes are not recommended as first line therapy for smoking cessation because many patients they 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 even 30% of our patient which are operators mm. they are smokers they they they, they use pds so e cigarettes are not recommended so this is a patient uh, uh, which i operated 18 years ago uh, he came uh, recently he came to know that from nama shahar he came to know that i am in aims he came here i operated in 2006 i simply gave one left internal memory artery to led and uh, vein grafts to om and pda he is doing fine he is now 85 he was 66 at that time uh, i am thankful to such patients who keep trust on us and 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 encourage us to deliver good thank you very much Excellent talk. I think the the fight or we can say the competition between PCI and CABG will always remain there. You see, as long as long as the cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons are there, you see, I don't think this is going to end. You see, even in the near future. Uh, I think uh, I still feel. You see, as you said, the most important uh, I think work is it is teamwork. Because if the team work is good, you see, then you can very well decide in the interest of the patient. Uh, I welcome Dr. Bajit Kaur. My warm greetings to her. Thank you, ma'am, for your gracious presence. Uh, 
Uh, we welcome you, ma'am. Uh, uh, just uh, the last comments, as Sir was saying, uh, it's never the fight between the surgeon and the cardiologist. I think we work in collaboration for the benefit of... Uh, <laughs> no, there's no competition at all, sir. We are all working for the benefit of patient. And uh, I think Dr. Rajiv and myself, we have worked for umpteen number of patients together. This happened to operate on so many of my very dear family members also. When we talk of a patient with coronary artery disease, I think it's the patient's symptoms which direct us. In an acute event, we can't wait. PCI can be the most justified thing because it's very difficult to arrange for a surgery. When it comes to chronicity, ischemia trial has given us umpteen results to tell us that medical therapy is the best. We need to stabilize our patient with medical treatment. And if the patient still persists to have angina, despite OMT, OMT is optimized medical therapy. That means we achieve the target doses of beta blockers, we give empty nitrates to the patient, we are able to give all the target directed therapy and if we are able to do that and still the patient persists to be symptomatic, that is the time when we plan to revascularize and I think that is the time when we need to see the arteries and the surgeons help us by giving us the complete revascularization. So the hands of the surgeon is not just the surgery has been done, what grafts have been placed, where they have been placed and how it has been done. So it's always a collaboration 